Hello, my name's Chris Aslan Alexander and I'm a lecturer for the Art Society. Uh, usually I'd be out giving lectures or working as a curate here at St Barnabas Church. Uh, instead, because of the coronavirus, I am here on the first floor of St Barnabas in uh, Finchley. Um, but the usual activities, English classes, uh, the night shelter, uh, toddlers groups, worship nights, training events, kids church, all of that's of course had to be taken offline except for the night shelter and uh, so most people are now working from home and I know many of you are self-isolating and possibly feeling a little bit bored so I thought why not do a freebie lecture. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed uh, this afternoon and uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, cotton pickers and cosmonauts, that's the title of the lecture uh, and we'll be exploring um, how Soviet propaganda uh, affected many of the um, Central Asian mosaics that you see if you, if you go there uh, these days. So starting off with a bit about me, um, I was born in, in Turkey, which is why I've got Aslan as a middle name, and uh, grew up in Turkey and, and then in Warsaw and Beirut. Uh, and then I moved to Central Asia uh, once I'd finished university, and uh, I started off living in Hiva, which is a little desert oasis, just uh, south of Urgench, and I lived there for seven years working with UNESCO, uh, reviving uh, 15th century carpet designs and starting a silk carpet workshop where we reintroduced natural dye making and, and, uh, and various other techniques for making carpets and Suzanis. Uh, that's a whole nother lecture. Um, and then got kicked out of Uzbekistan. I, uh, I then ended up moving to Horog, which is on the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Uh, and I, I worked in the Pamir Mountains, which are up in this area here, uh, working with yak herders and teaching them how to comb their yaks for down uh, and uh, then got kicked out of there as well, uh, <coughs> accused of being a spy for Switzerland uh, and then ended up moving to Aslanbov, which is uh, just here in southern Kyrgyzstan in the world's largest natural walnut forest and was working there um, to develop a school for wood carving. So um, in all three places um, they were very remote, especially Horog, it took about 14 hours, if we were lucky, on a good day uh, to get from the capital city there. And if there were avalanches or mudslides, it could take a week. Um, but I would still manage to get myself to Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, or Bishkek, or Dushanbe. Uh, and these were all very Soviet-style cities with brutalist architecture, uh, very grey, very concrete, and yet in the midst of them there would be these beautiful mosaics that um, often w were surprising um, given how utilitarian architecture was in general. And so I started to take pictures of them, I started to, to research them and find out why 5% uh, of, of the whole cost of a municipal building being built by the state was often devoted to artistic elements. Why would the state be interested in art, uh, particularly a communist state? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we start off by looking at uh, the Russian Empire. Now the Russian Empire was the largest unbroken empire in the world. Um, even just Russia alone uh, is 60% larger than the next largest country, which is Canada. Uh, so you add on the rest and you just get this enormous area. And, and, and not just uh, Russia. Uh, I remember growing up, I thought that um, the Soviet Union was just the, so the, the Soviet name or the communist name for Russia. But no, I mean, you have Russia, but even within Russia, there are uh, people who are similar to Yakut people who are similar to um, uh, Inuit or Eskimos, as they were once known. You've got the Turkic people of Central Asia. You've got people in the Baltic area where sometimes... Uh, they speak in completely different languages from one village to the next, with a mountain in between. So this vast network uh, was, um, was all uh, Imperial Russia, and, uh, and then was to become uh, the United, well, the USSR. So um, you have these, these uh, communists who have this uncomfortable relationship with colonialism. They've inherited these lands that are effectively colonies, uh, how, how are they meant to empower them, how are they meant to be properly socialist and yet at the same time not allow them to become independent because they wanted to maintain those lands. Um, and also how are they supposed to get their message from one end to the other end of this vast empire. Uh, so what they developed was a system of agitation and propaganda and this department of agitation and propaganda was combined into Agiprop and uh, they started Agiprop 
trains. In fact, there were even some Agiprop boats that would also ply the Volga River. So these are Agiprop trains. Uh, they would travel all over the, the Russian Empire, and uh, they'd get out at, at whatever station they were planning to be at. Um, and you'd have sloganeers who would paint graffiti and slogans. You'd have rabble-rousers who would gather the masses in the bazaars and the, in the, the market squares <coughs> and get them... Uh, talking and get them uh, hopefully on board with the socialist cause. Um, on board, they had everything that they needed for that. They had a, a, a team who were equipped. The problem was that most people were illiterate. Uh, it was at least 90% of Russians, and I think that percentage got even higher for non-Russian uh, citizens of, of uh, the Russian Empire. Um, however, although these people may not be able to read letters, they were very good at reading pictures. In fact, most Orthodox churches were, were designed to be, to be read visually. So people were used to reading images, and the challenge for them now was, um, for these agiprop uh, agitators, was how can we start a visual message that will somehow win people to our cause? Uh, this is Vladimir uh, Mayor, Mayorkovsky, um, and uh, he was one of many of the sort of avant-garde, uh, uh, left-leaning liberals who joined the socialist cause. Um, one of his aims was to make sure that art was taken out of the bourgeois uh, museums and places of traditional high culture and taken to the working man and the working woman. He said, the streets are our brushes and the squares are our palettes. And uh, looking back in 1927 at what they were able to achieve in those first 10 years of, uh, uh, of communist rule, he said, uh, it meant a nation of 150 million being served by hand by a small group of painters. It meant news sent by telegram, immediately translated into posters, decrees into couplets. It meant Red Army men looking at posters before going into battle, rather, rather than at, at icons, and with a prayer Sorry, and not with a prayer, but with a slogan on their lips. So this was all part of this movement to try and take people away from the old guard of, of um, class and religion into a new, bright, golden, secular future. And we can see the avant-garde art influence in some of the early posters that they produced. Now, um, as soon as the, the Soviet Union um, began, or rather as soon as Imperial Russia collapsed, there was... Uh, a civil war between the whites, who were loyal to the old regime, to the Tsar, and the reds, who were a mixture of communists and socialists and other groups that eventually ended up in gulags, um, but that at that stage were all united. So um, gradually, as the reds were able to win over areas that had printing presses, they realized that the poster was the way to go. Uh, it was cheap. You could come up with new designs and new, new visual uh, messages uh, and replace them fairly easily. And the most important thing is that a poster was ubiquitous. It could be everywhere. You could post them up um, in any, any public setting, thereby making that public setting a place of message. Uh, so this message here, for example, the red wedge will beat the white circle. So this was a battle strategy of concentrating all of the, the firepower of the reds against this one area to try and break through a blockade. Um, and yet very quickly, this is the, the 1st of, of May, 1920. So this is... In the first few years of this new fledgling uh, Soviet Union, we start getting quite sophisticated iconography. So uh, let's explore some of it. Um, we've, got the, we've got the big rising sun, the dawn. Um, it, you're going to find that there's no subtlety going on here. Um, so we've got the, the dawn. We've got symbols that were once maybe symbols of, of low-class workers, so the hammer, the sickle. They're now being held with pride. Um, we've, we've got egalitarianism between the sexes. So you can see this, this peasant woman, she's striding forward with her, her chest out. And uh, we've got children who represent the future. We've also got, very importantly, multi-ethnicity. So not only do we have other members of the, of, of the Soviet Union who were not Slavic, but also of the wider world that the Soviet Union was trying to influence, whether it be Africans or, even more importantly, African-Americans, whether it be Chinese, um, Arabs, and so on. And then you can see the old guard of capitalism is being trodden on, and it's in darkness, and it's insignificant. And then you can see the multilingual, the different languages that are being used as well to, to create this sense of unity across the board. So many of these um, posters have become very famous, 
and uh, we often recognise them. These are just a few of them. Often we don't know the people who, who painted them. Uh, they didn't see themselves in this, in this instance as creating art, rather they were just doing their part for the, the greater socialist cause. So uh, here's, a, here's a quote from Dimitri Moore. He was one of the, the Agiprop people. He said, art must be everywhere, on the streets, in trams, in factories, in workshops, and in workers' apartments. But here's the question. Should the same art appear all over the place? Or did they need to start coming up with a more bespoke message, and maybe even a more bespoke medium, in order to get the message of socialism across to such an enormous and diverse area, particularly the area of Central Asia, where people were mainly Muslim, many of them objected to being ruled by the Tsar, an infidel, and certainly didn't want to be ruled by some godless communist. And uh, inspiration came from an unlikely source. So if you were to look at the Turkmen of um, the early 20th century, Turkmen men were largely decorative. They were there for procreation and for raiding and slaving. That was their main function. Women were the ones who, who ran the whole economy and who cared for the animals, who, um, who looked after the, the yurts, and who made the yurts, um, and also who produced absolutely fantastic, uh, beautiful pile textiles. And uh, this was really their, their pride and joy. Uh, not only would these textiles uh, tell stories of their own tribal um, loyalties and tribal heritages, as, as, as you would get a woman from one tribe marrying into another and bringing together the guls or the designs from her mother's tribe together with her mother-in-law's tribe and so on. Uh, but also, because these were so valuable, they could also sell them. So it was another way of, of, of saving currency. But the problem with carpets is they're quite capitalist because you need someone poor enough to make it and rich enough to buy it. So the socialists were not happy with this and they wanted to just make everyone start buying naff-looking um, Soviet carpets that were all mass-produced in factories until one enterprising Turkmen woman wove into her carpet uh, in honour of Baba Lenin. And then suddenly, it wasn't a carpet anymore, suddenly it had become propaganda. It had become a message that, that was um, showing, showing both ethnic difference but also socialist uh, unity. And pretty soon you started getting portrait carpets woven all over the place. So if we have a look at these ones, these are, uh, this one's got a very high knock count of Lenin and then um, or Castro here, well, he hasn't done quite so well, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can see there's quite a sophisticated iconogra iconography being used as well um, in some of these carpets. So you've got um, industry, we've got um, traditional instrumentation and, and national dress, but also modernity combined, modernity and progress combined with traditional values. And then, of course, Baba Lenin smiling down from the carpet. So let's have a look at some of the early uh, posters that were being produced. This one here is quite sobering. Uh, let's remember that Kazakhstan was, was a breadbasket, um, but most of the Kazakhs were nomads, and they were being forcibly settled by, um, by the Soviets. Originally, they built them small little concrete um, huts to live in, and they said, oh, that would be great for our horses, and they carried on living in their yurts, and then gradually they were forcibly settled. Um, without an understanding of how nomadism works, um, and, and, then, and then with the disastrous attempt to collectivize farms, to the extent that roughly half of all Kazakhs died during the first 20 years or so of Soviet rule. And it wasn't until the 1960s that they reached their pre-Soviet numbers again. Um, and uh, this poster here says, if you do not work, you do not eat. So this was a time of, of in some places, mass starvation. This one's a little bit more encouraging. This one says, uh, water, um, it, water is life. Um, and at the turn of the 20th century, only 3% of the whole of Central Asia, and just to put things in perspective, Kazakhstan alone is the same size as the whole of Europe. Uh, so only 3% of Central Asia was irrigated and, and settled. So there was now this, this huge drive to try and irrigate more areas of this incredibly fertile land and bring it to life. Uh, you can see here, that here we've got our rough and ready communi communists, they're local, you know, they're, they've got patched cloaks and stuff, but they're happy, and they, they, they may not be rich, but they're happy. Then we've got the unhappy old guard, and we've got quite a lot of the old guard. You've got your mullers, um, you've got your fat, rich landowners, your begs, and then you've got your corrupt kazis or judges. And they're often caricatured in many of these um, 
uh, in this instance, the other, the other group that needs to be dealt with are the Jadidis. So the Jadidi movement was a movement to modernize Islam. So these were Muslims saying, we want to be Muslim, but we want to be 20th century Muslims. They would often wear um, Western clothing, and they had already um, um, introduced uh, moder moder uh, modernity in some respects to the madrasa system. But the old madrasa system where you had to learn the Quran by heart and were beaten if you got it wrong, um, that's all being swept away now with a new alphabet that's being introduced, a Latin alphabet. Uh, so this is Uzbek in Latin, uh, and, uh, and these are modern, happy, happy Uzbeks with factories and, and, and with um, tractors. Uh, incidentally, the, the alphabet wasn't kept for that long. Eventually, they moved from, from Arabic to Latin to Cyrillic. And then, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they've gone back to Latin again. So, the Uzbeks have had to get used to a number of different scripts. And here we've got our feckless old um, uh, farm workers who sit around drinking tea, and meanwhile, all of their farming equipment is falling into disrepair. It's in darkness. Uh, and then we've got our collective farmers who've got their brand new collective farms and they're happy picking cotton. And uh, so this is this this actually says. Uh, there are no good um, uh, traditional farmers, only good collective farmers. So, not subtle. Uh, here we've got profiteers, that might be quite sort of relevant at the moment with people hoarding. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so they're being told off for hoarding, and here you've got your, your collective farmers who are happily going, following the rules, and of course they're, they're in orange, and these people are shifty, and they're in dark colours. Uh, this is a great one. So this is a poster celebrating progress. You can see that the, the train lines are now there. Uh, when the train tracks were first built in Central Asia, they were known as Shaitan's Arba, or Satan's Wagon. And people were, were spitting on their hearts whenever they went past. But you know, within a couple of years, they were getting on board, quite literally. Um, so here we've got um, the traditional old style of, of plowing, which is very backward and labor intensive. But our man here, he's developed, or he's using, uh, the new sophisticated Soviet ways of distributing cotton seeds. And that's much to the annoyance of the mullah and the landowner. And look how tiny they are in comparison with him. So again and again, size really does matter. And, uh, and often the, the old guard are presented as these little parasites. They're small, they're irritating, but you know, we don't need to worry about them. We can move on. They're so small in this case that this new Soviet um, uh, tractor is able to just plow them into the ground. So there was an absolute obsession with tractors because they were seen as a symbol of modernity. And, uh, and often people in Central Asia had, had tractors and cinemas long before anyone did in Russia because they realized they're the ones we've got to try and get on board. They're the ones we need to win over and impress. Uh, again, here we've got our, our Soviet tractor. In this case, it's... It's plowing down the old guard. There's a mosque falling down. Um, uh, there are, there's, there's disunity. And again, look how small these people are. Meanwhile, we've, we've got our new modern Soviet system of collective farming coming in. Like I said, we're not talking subtle here. Um, again, they, here we've got a Soviet, a Soviet Uzbek. So he's, um, he's still wearing a traditional robe uh, and a skull cap, but he's also looking up to, to Baba Lenin and meanwhile, he's mowing down um, the old guard of the mullahs and the, and the kazis and so on. Um, here we've got another uh, Soviet, tra traditional, um, sorry, traditional Soviet man and then modern Soviet man. They're both, they're both Muslims, uh, but, but this man is going to leave behind his, his, his slightly old, more traditional ways, leave behind this kind of black and white old guard of the Muslim calling people to prayer and introduce people to cinemas and to... Um, new systems. I love this poster. Uh, we're going to talk about the artist who painted this a little bit later. This says, uh, It means, it's a man sh shaming poster. Come on men, you all need to pick cotton. Um, so you can see the feckless men sitting up here doing nothing. Meanwhile, you've got mainly women, but a few hardworking men in the cotton fields. And then you've got this woman telling them to get off their backsides and get on with it. This is by the same, the same artist. It says not one gram of, of uh, white gold must be wasted. So you can see the woman picking up a little bit of stray cotton. And um, 
Central Asia, as far as uh, the Soviets were concerned, was basically there for growing cotton. That was the one big, big function. And uh, growing cotton um, was very labor intensive. Uh, it required um, being hand-picked as well, um, and needed huge numbers of people to get out into the fields from the beginning of September till the end of November, uh, or middle of November, to be, to be picking cotton. Um, <clears throat> and they decided to make the Harvest Festival almost a quasi-religious experience. So you can see all of these um, arbas, or wagons, uh, with people, with instruments, um, uh, announcing the, this offering that's being laid at the, at the foot of the, sort of the Soviet gods of modernity and progress. Uh, and if you were to go to Central Asia today, especially to Uzbekistan, you'll still see that they'll bring in the harvest with, with um, these nais, which are the, the very long trumpets, and, and with uh, the, the, the drums as well, the toira. This poster here is, is reminding people it, it's your right and it's your duty to vote, but, but be careful who you vote for. Here's who you shouldn't vote for. Don't vote for the corrupt old mullahs. Don't vote for the rich landowners. Don't vote for the corrupt judges who are taking backhanders. And don't vote for your feckless mate just because he happens to have nothing better to do than to, to try and get you to vote for him. Uh, even a poster like this may not look obviously propagandic, but here we've got men and women fraternizing together. They're learning to read, so there's literacy for both men and women. Uh, the women are wearing headscarves, uh, but they're not covering their faces. So they're, they're Muslim, but they're kind of Muslim light. And similarly, the men are wearing caps, but not turbans. And outside, we can see progress with new buildings being built. Uh, this poster is a happy family who aren't being stupid. They're not saving their money by putting it under a mattress. They're heading off to the, the cotton bank, and uh, they're prosperous, and they're going to put their money there, and they've got enough money to be able to buy cloth and they've even got um, enough money to buy toys for their, for their son um, and again uh, they, they're, they're Uzbek but they're just not too Uzbek they're not too Muslim um, and uh, you get a nice little scene of people queuing up to go into the, the, the cotton or the pachta um, factory and then if we look at this, this is uh, a poster from Tajikistan uh, the 3rd of March and you can see the date it's 1957 so this is moving on quite a way and um, again, we can see the perfect Tajik Soviet couple. So both the man and the woman are wearing pillbox hats. Um, so this is a nod to their cultural past. But then they're also wearing clothes that would be worn by any Soviet citizen anywhere in the Soviet Union. Um, and, and that's contrasted slightly with, with older and more rural men in their robes. And you've got some young girls who are also similarly dressed. And it's celebrating the 3rd of March, which is um, Veterans Day. Um, so this was, one, this was really the aim um, of the Soviets when they came into Central Asia, and it was to try and liberate the, the, uh, the women of Central Asia, particularly those who were from sedentary cultures. Um, when, when Imperial Russia started to move into the area that they called Turkestan, which we refer to today as Central Asia, uh, many of the sedentary women started to cover up. Before then, they would have worn turbans and, and headscarves and a kind of a wimple type thing, now they were wearing the paranja. So the paranja, it's a robe that goes over your head um, and then it has long sleeves that go, go down behind. They're sewn together um, as a symbol that you're your husband's slave. And then over the front, you would wear the chedra, which is a horsehair veil. Um, all women would have scarring on their nose and on their chin um, from, from the veil rubbing against them. And... Uh, you need to really know your sister's shoes if you go into the bazaar, because if you get lost, how are you going to find each other? Um, and then if there are no, no men around, you can flip your, your chedra back and have a chat, and then if a man comes, you flip it back over again. So you, as you can see, it makes people look like upright coffins, and uh, it's very oppressive. And so they started the, uh, the struggle, as they called it, the hudrong. So this was going to be the struggle to, to emancipate women. Um, and they had a long way to go because this was just simply what all women in, in um, sedentary Turkestan wore, as opposed to the nomadic women who would still wear their turbans and so on, but had, had open faces. Um, so the first women who were sent out into Tashkent to try and liberate their sisters, they all had their throats slit. So they were the, the next wave were then sent out with revolvers 
uh, and, and gradually, you know, they, they were able to, to, to win the battle. So this is um, on the um, 8th of March, which is International Women's Day, and here is a local woman being ritually unveiled, so the cheddar is being taken off. And uh, so these women, you can see, some of them still wear headscarves. Uh, this is a particularly modern Soviet lady who's, who's, who's bareheaded. Um, and then they would have mass veil burnings as well. So these big kind of propagandic events to try and emancipate uh, women and show that this was a new era. Uh, and this is uh, another example of, of it in a, in a line drawing. Uh, so there were posters as well to try and encourage women to, to be liberated. Here we have a liberated lady um, calling on her sisters and you can see the ghostly figure it's it's almost invisible in these ones and gets more clear as you go along and she's calling on her her sisters to um to unveil themselves um, i love this one here you, we've got um a woman who's a, a girl who's taken off her veil she's trampling it on the floor her her mother and her father and the mullah they're all imploring her to go back to the old ways but she's being ushered into a new soviet future by these charming looking young man so uh and here we've got a woman who's <laughs> like saying to the mullah no i don't need your i don't need your quran i've got my lenin book that actually says lenin on it and you can see how tiny the the mullah is um speaking of perspectives um again here we have a rather scary looking giant woman and uh she's sweeping away the mullah with his quran and with his mosque and uh, she's, she's, she's not worried about them at all. In fact, she looks like she's taking a spare bit of pleasure in the process. Uh, meanwhile, other ladies are starting to unveil themselves. So this is from the Caucasus area of Azerbaijan. Uh, in this case, we actually do have the mullah as larger than life, um, with his Quran there. And he's watching with annoyance as girls start to get themselves educated and start to uh, develop... Um, uh, equality and uh, and that's captured in this poster as well so this is a poster by Ustamumin um, and here you've got two women from the old guard they're gossiping uh, they're obviously talking about this this young Soviet woman but she's striding forward she's got her books she's she's uh, she's not afraid about what they have to say um, and this is one of my favorite posters I actually have this poster up in my uh, in my room um, <clears throat> so this is a um, uh, sisters being called to emancipate themselves and come on girls take off your veils and you too can drive a tractor and pick cotton and work in a factory um, some of these you may have noticed are, are written in, in Cyrillic so some of them are in Russian some of them are in um, Persian scripts and some are in Latin scripts so it's a whole mixture and a mixture of languages as well so we've got Russian, Tatar, Tajik, Uzbek, Azeri uh, and, and several other like Kyrgyz, several other languages. Uh, this is pointing out all the things that a woman can be now. A woman can work in a factory. A woman can teach in a school. A woman can be part of local government administration. A woman can be part of uh, village courts. And a woman can also be part of a collective farm. Uh, this woman here, a Kyrgyz woman, she's working in a factory. And the sparks that come off her are the mullah... Uh, the, the rich landowner, in this case a shifty looking businessman and uh, so uh, also calling on nomadic people as well to, to not only settle but start working in factories uh, here we've got emancipation across the, across the different racial divides so this is a Russian woman and a Tatar woman meeting together and it's written down here in, in Tatar in Arab script and then in Russian as well in Cyrillic script um, this poster is, is remembering some of the things that that um, can go on in nomadic cultures that are bad for women, particularly bride napping. So bride napping um, is when a young man likes a, a girl from another village, but where they can't afford the bride price or the family don't want to uh, let her go. And then he gallops into the village, throws her, her over his shoulder and, and gallops off, and then basically has his way with her. And once he has, then she's kind of obliged to, to marry him. And uh, it's actually... They've seen a resurgence of this, particularly in Kyrgyzstan, a little bit in Kazakhstan as well. Now it's more a case of dragging a girl, screaming, um, dragging her by the hair into a car, taking her off, raping her, and then expecting her to, to marry them. Uh, in fact, the, um, the fine for stealing someone's cow is higher than for stealing someone's daughter. Uh, so uh, even this year, on the, 
of the 8th of March, International Women's Day, there were a group of Kyrgyz women who were protesting and uh, they were set upon by uh, Kyrgyz men and beaten up. So there's still a long way to go as we sort of see ourselves heading back to some of the days that the Soviets were determined would never return. Uh, this poster again looks at some of the different practices um, that can go on with, with women. There's the mass veil burning, the ritual unveiling. <coughs> um, and again, here we've got a glorious sun, a glorious future, and Russian women calling on their, their Muslim sisters to emancipate themselves. Um, another big theme was the war. Uh, we tend to think of the Second World War as um, often you know, good old Brits and Americans against the rest of the world. We tend to forget that, there's, that for every one Allied soldier, ten Soviet soldiers died. And, and many of them were Central Asians. Many of them were Muslims. Uh, many of them were sent without any weapons, and they were just cannon fodder. fodder. So this is a poster calling on people to give up money for war bonds. And although Central Asia never knew the war, um, huge numbers of Central Asians were sent off to the front and never came back again. Um, here we have the theme of um, unity across the racial divides. So we've got a Kyrgyz here in his um, white kalpak, uh, and then a Russian. Uh, here we've got, we've got um, uh, to, 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 great, to, to great Stalin, written in all the different languages of, uh, of the Soviet Union. So we've got a mixture of Russian, Georgian, Azeri, Uzbek, Tajik, Kyrgyz, Kazakh, I mean, uh, and various other ones as well. And it just says down here in, um, in Kyrgyz, I think, um, but in Latin script, uh, may, may the Soviet Union live and prosper, we praise you, we worship you. Um, and then this is a poster from <clears throat> the 1950s. Again, it's celebrating uh, the racial differences and unity between um, Russians and, in this case, a, a Turkmen. Um, and yet, it also sends a subtle message, which is, uh, listen, Turkmen ladies, we're all equal, but some of us are more equal than others. So you go out and break your backs in the fields, and, you know, once you've picked all the cotton, we'll, we'll take it from there. So there was definitely a racial hierarchy within the Soviet Union, with the Slav Slavic people and the Germans at the top, and with Central Asians at the bottom. So Polonsky, he said, the poster is a weapon of mass persuasion, a device for constructing collective psychology. Uh, but um, gradually, as the Soviet Union got more established, although posters were still produced, uh, the Soviets started to invest in more permanent um, art forms that were public and that could be seen by everybody. So you got some very monolithic, huge uh, works of art. That, um, every single town would have a, a bust or a statue of Lenin. That was just the thing. Um, and uh, that was where, when you got married, you would go as a bridal couple to lay down flowers. Uh, and every, every, um, every town or village would also have some kind of statue to commemorate the, the great war against fascism. Um, but yeah, so th there wasn't that much imagination that went into um, uh, the, the various uh, st statues that were put up. Instead, they realized that if they could take uh, buildings wouldn't it be great if they could turn that building into a canvas? And they started to realise that mosaics might be the way forward. So you'd find mosaics, first of all, in some of the metro stations. And that whole principle of bringing art out of uh, the places of the elite and into the, the places of work uh, was, was something that you'll see if any of you have ever been on the Moscow metro. So when you travel along the metro, every single station has a different theme and uh, is beautifully rendered. And this was so that basically your commute to work was a trip through a museum. Even if you were to go to the opera, I remember when I first moved to Tashkent in uh, 98, uh, all, all the operas were, and ballets were being shown at 5.30 in the afternoon. And the reason for that was so that the working man, after they clocked off in the factory, could get themselves some high culture and still be home in time for tea. Um, so we start seeing even the most dullest of Soviet-looking uh, blocks of flats just being adorned with, with, with mosaics. And mosaics were relatively cheap to produce. They were very hard-wearing, hard and, uh, and they would enable uh, the whole side of a building to become a canvas. So let's have a look at some of them. This is a typical uh, generic Russian mosaic in one of the metro stations. You've got Lenin, you've got the, the, the Great War Against Fascism, 
Um, we're getting into children as well. They're the future. Um, and um, it's, it's fairly generic. But before we go further, um, how did mosaics start? So mosaics were originally a Greco-Roman art form. They started off as floor coverings um, uh, made with, with little square tesserae. Uh, but gradually they would develop and become more sophisticated uh, to the extent that if you were the pictorius imag imaginarius, so if you were the artist, you, you could get paid quite a lot for designing very Im impressive mosaics. However, usually you would only do the bits that were complicated and then the, the rest, the background, if you like, was filled in by just your, your everyday mosaic maker who would get paid maybe about the same amount as um, um, a blacksmith or as a baker. Um, and then in the Christian era, as, as uh, the Greco-Roman world started to become Christianized, um, mosaics were taken on board. This is Daniel in the lion's den. Um, <clears throat> and then the, Greeks, the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox Church um, both started to, to use mosaics in their churches as places of worship. So if you look at this, this picture here, this entire church is just one big mosaic, absolutely covered and quite glorious. Um, and... Um, uh, and when Islam started to invade the area that is now um, the Mediterranean basin, uh, they, had, they had problems with mosaics because many of them were, were pictorial and to, to show the, the face of a human being was haram. They were, they were fine with, with anything, you know, pomegranates was okay, anything vegetal. Um, and gradually they started to evolve and they started to, to co-opt some of what they'd learned. And, and so, for example, this is the Shirdo Madrasa in... Um, in Samarkand today, and again, it's covered in mosaics, um, absolutely breathtaking. But these mosaics are quite different. So if we look back at a Greek mosaic, um, you can see most of the shapes are more or less square. We've got the, um, the eye of, of the lion here is a triangle, but in general, we're looking at, at square pieces. But, but what, the, um, what the, the Muslims started to do was to actually uh, shape and carve their different tiles and pieces and then fit them together like a jigsaw. So if we look at this piece here, there are, I, don't, I can count, but probably at least 50 different individual pieces that have all been put together. And the way that you would do that is that you would um, draw out your design, maybe on paper, and then cut it up, paste it onto different coloured tiles, and then, and then cut these, these out, chisel them and sand them down. This is um, the block they use for sanding down. Then those individual pieces would then be reassembled and then plaster would be put on them and then that's what you would end up with. So it's quite a lot of work. And uh, you can see when you look at a mosaic, now that you know what the work that goes into it, it's quite impressive. So this is the, uh, the Cotton Pickers metro station in Tashkent. And they've taken mosaics of differing sizes and they've, again, tried to use that slightly more Muslim style of mosaic making. Uh, same if you go to, to Chosu Bazaar in Tashkent. It's got this wonderful sort of space age looking uh, retro dome over it. And again, all of these mosaic pieces have been designed to interlock rather than just be square pieces of tesserae. If you look at many of the apartment blo blocks, um, they look just the same as any other apartment block or block of flats anywhere in the Soviet Union, but with a few little stylistic changes. So here, for example, we've got the effect of um, the wooden screens, but made out of concrete. And then here, we've got the whole side covered in arabesques. And so that's saying you're, you're Soviet, but you're our flavour, our local flavour of Soviet. Let's explore some of the themes that we would, you'd find. Um, here's one of racial harmony. Um, often you get traditional scenes where here you can see we've got a suzami, which is a form of um, embroidery. Uh, this is in, in Dushanbe in Tajikistan. And then, and then people enjoying tea. Uh, something like this is obviously a fire station. <coughs> um, but even, even the way that the, that the firemen are fighting the fire, there's a real serenity about it and a real sense of um, um, lack of panic and organisation. Um, so these, these mosaics always had to have some kind of message, and they always do. Uh, one of the big messages, of course, was the huge celebration that, um, that was the winning of the space race. Although the Americans like to say that they won the space race, it was actually um, the, uh, the Soviets who got the first cosmonaut into space, the first man, the first dog, the first woman, all Soviets. They just didn't get to the moon first. Um, and if you go to Baikonur today, which is in Kazakhstan, this is where all of the, the, the Soviet and now today the Russian 
uh, spacecrafts and so on, they're, they're, they all um, take off from here. So it's known as the Cosmodrome. And you can see this amazing mosaic of this cosmonaut floating towards you. Um, so this was a really big celebration. And actually, Central Asians, even though they were never... Um, they were never part of the elite cosmonauts who actually went to space. Those people were all Jews or, or Slavs or, or Germans. Uh, they, would, they would still co-opt and, and celebrate the, the, um, the, the winning of getting, getting people into space. So, for example, this is in Karakal, Pakistan, which is a semi-autonomous region um, uh, just south of the Aral Sea, or what was the Aral Sea, in Uzbekistan. And people there are nomadic, so we've got camels and yurts, but then you've got this, um, this cosmonaut who seems to have just kind of floated down into, into Karakal Pakt life and, and, and seems quite happy there. Um, uh, I love this. So, first of all, look just how rubbish the actual apartment is. I mean, it would not be a particularly nice place to live. This is in Tajikistan. Um, but here we're celebrating the Al Biruni um, and some of the other great um, people from Central Asian history. Al Biruni, um, he... Uh, he was based in Samarkand. He developed um, to within a couple of decimal places of the most sophisticated computers today. Uh, he was able to estimate exactly how long it takes for the, the Earth to go around the sun. Um, and uh, you can still see the sextant of the remains of, um, the remains of his sextant in Samarkand. Most things were raised to the ground by the mullahs because they weren't happy with all his scientific uh, achievements. But he was way ahead of his time. And, and so we've got this history of, of, um, of gazing at the stars and looking at them, and then now we have people actually going to them as well. So there's this unbroken lineage that takes place within the sort of Soviet story. Um, and again here, I, I love this. This is all in turquoise, and if you've ever, ever stopped to think about it, turquoise, turquoise, simply means the colour of the Turks. And so it's managed to make this very drab-looking apartment block look quite beautiful. We've got both a blend of the cosmonaut with the zodiac, but then also these arabesques that represent Central Asia. So a bringing together of these two cultures. Um, here's the first lady in space. Sadly, I think her mosaic looks a bit rubbish, but what can you do? Um, then an, another of the, um, uh, of the, the big themes, again, is, is the sacrifice that was made during the, the, the Second World War or the Great War Against uh, Fascism. Uh, these um, are mosaics that are outside uh, the Tashkent School of um, a Museum of Applied Arts. So you can see different forms of artistic expression, although the irony is that most of these art forms were being um, exterminated during the Soviet times because everything needed to be mass-produced in factories. And you can see again, this is men working as, as potters, as metal chasers. Um, now this is an interesting uh, uh, mosaic. I apologise for... The angle at which I've taken the photo, but it's on a very, very busy main road and I didn't want to get run over. Um, at first glance, it just looks like a nice family picture. We've got a family with a, a plate of pomegranates sitting on a felt. Um, but the perspective of it is that it's, it's very flat. It's flat on. There's no receding perspective and there's a reason for that. If we go back and have a look at um, traditional pictorial art, it did exist in Central Asia. Uh, these are illuminations to 15th century manuscripts. And although, although it would be haram against Islam to, to, to portray actual uh, humans, uh, whenever you have art, you have ego. So you had the shahs and the, the sultans and the emirs who would commission books to be produced, uh, handwritten and then hand-illustrated as well. Um, because they wanted to be remembered. So this is Shah Rukh, and you can see that his carpet is just a rectangle that's kind of levitating there. So there's no receding perspective. And um, uh, one of the first artists to come um, as a result of this, the Soviet Union, so he was brought in from Russia to Samarkand, he was told, develop a new local style of artistic expression. And uh, his name was uh, Alexander Nikolaev. But he's more commonly known as Ustomomin. So he started to take some of these, um, take his inspiration from the 15th century in some of these illuminated manuscripts. He also fell in love with the people uh, and the place of Samarkand and uh, was given the name Usto, which means master, uh, and then Mumin, which is a, a name that's often given to converts to Islam. 
So we don't know for sure that he became a Muslim, but he was certainly seen as an honorary Muslim by, by local people. And he started the Samarkand School of Art. Uh, and he developed... Uh, so he, he did these posters that you can see here. Um, they're his work. Um, but then he also um, painted this, for example. And you can see this is a homoerotic story. He himself was a homosexual. A uh, homoerotic story of two young men falling in love. But you can see um, that the... The corporature that this boy is sitting on is, is flat on. The, the tablecloth is flat on. Everything has that, that lack of receding perspective. And this became um, a popular style of art and a popular form of art. And we see how, how it translates into the mosaics as well. So this is a mosaic in Karakal, Pakistan. You've got the dustahan or food cloth directly on the, the carpet. Um, and uh, so, so gradually the Soviets started to develop a synergy of, of Russian but also local elements. And, and we see that some, something here, this is an ordinary tea house in, in uh, Tajikistan. And it's just celebrating um, the fruits of people's labours, but also all of these designs are local embroideries. And that became one of the chief motifs that they would use in, in Tajikistan. Um, again, te local textiles. Um, so this is a textile um, factory. We've got local instruments, so it's, it's a celebration of all things local. So there was really this attempt to not be seen to being um, colonial um, and, and encouraging local expression. Um, but then there was also modernity as well. So here we have an old Kyrgyz lady wearing the traditional Kyrgyz um, wimples and turban. And then she, her daughter, who's even showing her sleeves, and then her grandson, who's definitely a Soviet little kid. Uh, here we've got Kyrgyz and Kazakhs, uh, both in mosaic form and both in national dress. So national culture was always celebrated. Um, you can see it here. This is an ensemble in Uzbekistan, um, a musical um, conservatoire. And again, national dance and national instruments being celebrated. Even um, this mosaic here, which looks relatively um, unpropagandish, if that's such a word, um, actually is telling a story as well. So this is a, an apartment block, and, and here we just see a nuclear family of, of husband, wife, and one child. They've got a dove as well, but that's to celebrate peace. So um, that's partly because there was a drive to try and encourage families to move out of uh, courtyards where they would live with their extended family and their relatives and move into um, uh, individual family units in, in blocks of flats. Here we've got uh, a, a unity between the races. So we've got Kyrgyz and Russian together with Baba Lenin in the background. This isn't a mosaic, I just added it because I love it. Uh, this is a, a painting that was um, in, in the museum, in one of the museums in Dushanbe. I think it's been removed now because they're gradually getting rid of all their Soviet past. But I just love how you've got kind of babe magnet Lenin surrounded by the adoring women of the world all in their national costume. Who doesn't like Lenin, eh? Um, and, and we get the same sort of idea here, this big, happy Soviet family of diversity, and not just people from the Soviet Union, but also from the Eastern Bloc. So Cubans, people um, from other countries that were influenced by um, communism, but not necessarily part of the Soviet Union. However, as I said before, some were more equal than others. And, and, and we live in an age now of representation. That's something we talk a lot about. Um, political correctness or wokeness is another word that's come in, in vogue recently. But actually, that's all existed in, in the Soviet times, long before we came up with it. So here we've got um, at least one woman in this factory. But then we've also got a Kazakh, because it's in Kazakhstan, uh, and, and then a Russian man. On the other side of the factory, we have a Kazakh woman and then two Russian men. So you always want to make sure that minorities or, or local people are represented and that, and that both men and women are represented. Um, except in this case, in this factory, we've only got Kyrgyz. And the reason for that is this is a, a Kyrgyz factory in, in Osh, in the south of Kyrgyzstan. And at that time, most of the people who lived there were Uzbeks. And the Kyrgyz tended to live up in the mountains and were still semi-nomadic. So this was an attempt to try and get Kyrgyz to start moving down into the city and, and start working in factories rather than being in their yurts up in the mountains. Here we've got, again, the unbroken line of history. We've got the, the old ways with the pickaxe and then the modern ways with the drill. This is um, uh, a factory that's up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere in uh, Tajikistan. Um, possibly the most depressing mosaic that we'll look at today. This is in Adalsk. 
It's a happy scene showing fish being caught and then being canned. But of course, there are no fish anymore because the ROC doesn't exist. It's now just a, a, a complete desert wasteland of, of salt and chemicals and dust. Here we've got an ordinary factory scene um, that could be from anywhere in the Soviet Union, but they've just added on these little arabesques um, to let you know that we're in Uzbekistan. Um, as I said, some, some races were more equal than others. Nearly all of the people who were the major artists and also, in this case, the mosaic designers uh, were nearly all Slavs or Germans. The man who designed this one in Bishkek, this is a textile factory, he was German, and this is his wife. Uh, and if there are any Kyrgyz to be seen, they're just quietly there in the background. Again, here we've got national dress being celebrated. Uh, and um, again, textiles. And now we start seeing cotton coming in. So because a lot of textiles were produced in, in Central Asia, but also... It was where all the cotton was being picked. Cotton became a major theme. Uh, this woman here, um, she's got cotton growing up beside her um, and uh, factory modernity going on as well. This woman is tending um, uh, an orchard, so there's no cotton in this, in this picture, but cotton is back again with wheat as, as two of the main things that have been grown um, in Karakal, Pakistan and in Kazakhstan. Uh, here's some more cotton. Uh, this man is religiously tending a little cotton sapling as it grows, um, being watched by his family, and you can see cotton being produced in factories behind them. This woman here in Tajikistan, she's got possibly the largest hands ever. She's, uh, she's helping to nurture this cotton uh, plant as it grows up. And here's cotton being harvested and being brought in. And this is in Bukhara, and you can see the skyline of traditional Bukhara with people wrestling and a uh, bringing together of traditional culture, but also cotton growing. Um, this woman holds a book in one hand and, a, and a, a, a cotton bud in the other. And this lady, she's dancing with cotton, um, an apartment block in, in uh, Dushanbe. And then this, this is also in Dushanbe. This says, Roy Safet, which means may your road be white. And it's the kind of bon voyage. Uh, and again, cotton is growing up around this little girl. One other theme that was quite difficult for the Soviets to deal with was the theme of leisure and the theme of rest. Now, sport was easy because uh, sport was all about winning, winning against the capitalists when it came to the Olympics. So there'd be lots of um, portrayals of, of um, Olympic glory. You can see here, there's a, uh, this is an Olympian. This is in, in Tashkent. I think the last picture was in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Um, but in terms of leisure, leisure had to be medicalized. So what would happen is if you worked for, say, the local gas factory, uh, then you would be allotted uh, a two-week period at some point in the summer where you and your family would go off to the gas factory's um, sanatorium. And that would be somewhere nice. So it might be in the mountains or by the sea or by a lake. And then you would have swimming therapy or, or hiking therapy. And, but then there'll be doctors as well on hand to take your pulse and give you, um, give you vitamin injections and various other pseudoscience. Um, so this is um, actually the sanatorium next to uh, Warm Lake or Isikul in Kyrgyzstan. It's where Gagarin came after he'd um, he, to recover from his space flight. Uh, and uh, so you can see you know, people are in their swimming costumes, but there are also doctors and nurses around in lab coats to try and sort you out. So, I'm coming to the end of the lecture. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is that these pieces um, of tesserae were made um, from something called smalto. They were all made in the Baltics, um, but you only needed one factory to supply enough smalto for the whole Soviet Union um, because there were good transport links, and after all, it was all one country. Uh, these pieces of smalto, they were designed to withstand um, great temperature fluctuations, and Central Asia is a place of real temperature difference. Uh, in, in, in Central Asia, you can get to 45 plus in the summer and minus 40 in winter, so real extremes. One thing that these pieces of tesserae or smalto were not designed for was um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So as we get into capitalism, the shiny new yellow arches of McDonald's, suddenly the old sort of Soviet mosaics all look a little bit drab and a little bit passé. They were a reminder to people of a, a Soviet past that many of them were hoping to shrug off. Um, also, buildings now um, would often have new Chinese cladding put on, kind of Grenfell Tower style, to try and make the old buildings look a little bit smarter. 
Uh, in this case, they've actually worked with the mosaic that's here, but sometimes they would just cover over them. And many of these mosaics were put in prime places um, for people to see, and of course that mean, means that they're prime advertising spaces as well. So they start getting covered over by posters or, or, or what have you. Uh, another problem is, is just they weren't being um, looked after. In this case, I, I imagine local boys were gradually picking off the mosaic tesserae. Uh, this was as high up as they, were, they managed to get so far. But also in many cases, uh, many parts of Central Asia, the water table is very high and often there's a problem with damp, uh, even in desert oases areas. And, and that can also lead to these uh, small toe coming off and, and, and then not being replaced. Uh, for many schools, they didn't have money to pay teachers, never mind sorting out the mosaics they may have had. So gradually, these, these um, mosaics, many of them have just fallen into disrepair. Uh, there's been very little attempt to preserve them. There's, they're not seen as an art form in their own right. And many of them are just slowly decaying. In fact, I've talked to Russians who said, oh, we don't really have them in Russia anymore. You have to go to Georgia or Central Asia if you want to see them. And yet they can make even the dullest looking buildings beautiful. And, uh, and there was something that I came to really appreciate um, amongst all that brutalist grey concrete when I lived in, in Central Asia. And um, so I'm, they, they also give a real um, lens of how Russians and S Slavic people in general viewed Central Asians and then tried to make Central Asians think this is who you are. So there's... But they tell a story that of, of imperialism, however you want to look at it, and of colonialism. And uh, my fear is that um, they're not going to be around for much longer. So that's why I wanted to uh, talk, talk to you about them today. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. And thank you very much for, for listening. Um, it might be that there's going to be a comment section on um, YouTube when I put this up. So feel free to put in some questions and I'll try and answer them. And also, if you happen to know people who are not part of the art society, but who might be interested in coming along, only they're too busy, well, feel free to send them the link for this. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I've been Chris Aslan-Alexander, and hope you stay safe and virus-free.